Well, as I mentioned, uh, Jamie M. Neal has been serving as a consular officer in Shanghai, China, since 2007 when she managed the Fraud Prevention Unit and the American Citizen Service Section. In her various roles, Neal has helped to extradite a U.S. felon back to China, as well as to work with Chinese police to break up an underground ring smuggling Chinese people. She's half of a tandem foreign service couple and has been married to fellow economic officer James P. Neal, who's here at the back, uh, for eight years, during which she accompanied her husband to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and worked in the U.S. consulate for two years before joining the Foreign Service in 2006 as a public diplomacy officer. Neil was awarded the prestigious Secretary of State's Award for Volunteerism in 2005 for her work with the Brazilian Orphanage and a Meritorious Honor Award in 2009 for her contribution to the U.S. mission in China. She speaks Mandarin and Portuguese and will begin Arabic studies this fall in preparation for her, ne her next assignment to the U.S. Embassy in Cairo. Uh, born in Kahuku, uh, Hawaii, Neil comes from a rich heritage of Filipino, Hawaiian, Chinese, and Caucasian from the North Shore of Oahu. Her family later moved to San Diego, where she attend and she attended Brigham Young University Provo on a full scholarship majoring in political science. While in college, Neil reconnected with her Polynesian roots while, while participating in the Living Legends Performance Group, which, uh, as you know, showcases Polynesian, Hispanic, and Native American song and dance. Uh, I also have to mention she's also uh, a participant in BYU's uh, Model United Nations program, an alumna, alumna there. Um, Neil, uh, following graduation and a mission in Taiwan, she returned to study law at BYU, where she first learned of the Foreign Service during a summer law program in Shanghai. After graduating from BYU, she taught English and an inner city, as an inner-city school teacher in Washington, D.C., with Teach for America. Um, she and her husband, James, are the parents of two young children. As I mentioned, uh, and I'll mention again for those listening on the podcast, this lecture is, uh, has been coordinated through the Hometown Diplomat Program with the U.S. Department of State and BYU's own Foreign Service Student Organization. Um, today, she, uh, Ms. Mrs. Neal will be speaking on Inside the Foreign Service, Insights into International Affairs and Diplomacy Careers from a Junior Officer. Please uh, join us in welcoming Jamie M. Neal. Well, thanks, Corey. Um, yes, I am also a Model United Nations alumna, where I met Corey. <laughs> a couple years ago. Um, it's exciting to be back here and a little bit weird because I've, it's been over 10 years since I've been in the Kennedy Center. But it was here that I've, attending these lectures that I first became interested in international affairs and first started thinking about what I wanted to do for a career for myself. So it's, it's exciting to be back here and now to be at the podium. Um, as Corey mentioned, um, I've been in the Foreign Service for three years. And my husband, Jim, has been in the Foreign Service for six years. And we are a tandem couple in the Foreign Service, which means two, a husband and a wife, spouses, are both officers. And so we both have our own career tracks, but we get to work alongside each other in the embassies and move around with our family together to the different posts. I realized when I was an undergraduate that I, I was interested in a lot of things, um, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to do international development or if I was interested in working in Washington, D.C. on the Hill. Or I, I really was interested in many things, but I had a hard time pinning down my one true passion that I wanted to pursue. And it was after my freshman year at BYU that I first went overseas to the BYU Jerusalem Center. And it was during that time in Jerusalem that I realized that I really, I really loved living overseas, not just visiting foreign countries, but getting the chance to actually live there and to interact with Native, to interact with scholars and to learn languages and to really be in the country for a longer period of time than just a week's visit. And that experience really changed um, my perspective. I, I wanted to be able to work abroad and also um, gain experience in many different places, not just in one area. So that being said, I think being in the Foreign Service really, for me, is the best job in the world because for someone who has a little bit of geographic ADD and 
career ADD. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been in China for two years, and it's been great, but we're going to Egypt next, and that's exciting too. So I, China was fun. I, we did our two years there, and it's nice to be able to go on to something totally different, totally new language, totally different area of the world. And in addition to that, I really enjoyed the service component of being in the Foreign Service. We call it the Foreign Service, and it really it's the U.S. Uh, diplomatic corps overseas. So we represent the United States in the, in the countries that we are sent to. And it's a great honor to be able to represent our country and overseas and to also have the opportunity to live and travel abroad. As Corey mentioned, I graduated with a degree in political science and later came back to BYU after my mission to study law. While we were in law school, um, Jim and I went on a study abroad program to Shanghai. And while we were there, the Consul General of the U.S. Consulate invited us to come to the consulate to have a briefing on the State Department and what they do overseas. And that was the first time that I met a Foreign Service officer in person. And it was really fun. The, the consulate in Shanghai is in an old 1900s French mansion. And it, it looked exactly what I thought of the olden times of diplomats going overseas. And it had like a big red carpet and the seal of the United States and a flag. And it was, it was just so interesting to be there and hear him talk about the changes that China had made up to the point where he'd been there and the experiences that he'd had abroad. And that was the first time that we got, my husband and I really got to ask him questions about what it is to really live and do the work that he, did, that, he, that he does. And it was after that that we started the process of joining the Foreign Service. One thing about the Foreign Service that I really like is that you have a, you have a big say in your future. You have a say in where you go, and you have a say in which jobs you take. And being a family with two small children and also being a tandem, we are limited in many things. We want to go to places where there's school for our children, where there's jobs for both of us that allow us to take care of our responsibilities at home and also be working together full time. And so when we bid or when we propose the places we want to go, we take those into consideration and we can put down our top places that fit what works best for us. And so far the State Department has been very accommodating to families and that's something that has been wonderful in helping my husband and I um, as with each move. To, when we first signed up for the Foreign Service exam, my husband took it and passed on the first try. And, <laughs> and he, I, mean, you're, I don't know how many people that happens to, but that happened to him. And so he started the process before me. Um, it took a year for his processing to become complete, from taking the written exam to the oral, passing the oral examinations, then receiving his security clearance and his medical clearance. That whole time frame took a year. So during that time frame, we were already in Washington, D.C. and kind of went on with our own jobs we already had. I was teaching and he was working as an attorney at the uh, Department of Commerce. One thing about the Foreign Service is you don't need a college degree to join. You have, there are just a couple of requirements. One is you have to be a U.S. citizen. The second is you have to be at least 20 and no older than 59 when you first apply. And I found in our range of colleagues, so many different people have come to the Foreign Service from so many different backgrounds. There were the young people who came, you know, they're 21, graduated early from college, geniuses. You know, they're them. No experiences, but just right out of college they joined. And then in my, in my entering class, there were several attorneys who had had a full legal career, 20 years practicing law, and they decided they wanted to do something different. We had a nurse, um, there was a professional ice skater, there was a 911 operator, and there was a good friend of mine who, he breeds horses in Kentucky. So all of these different experiences brought together even though we're all coming from different backgrounds, we enter at the same time and we're trained and sent out on the same, um, on the same experience level. I think that's what really is what our diplomat should be. People from different walks of life, people from different states and different backgrounds, so that when we do go overseas, 
the people that we meet in different countries, foreigners and foreign nationals, when they meet us, they meet a variety of people. They don't just meet, you know, the top of the student at Harvard and Yale and they went to private schools their whole life. They meet all kinds of different people and that really is what America is, it's diversity. So they're looking for that. The other thing is you have to be available to go anywhere in the world. Now the State Department has, we have diplomatic relations with 180 of the 190, 191, some countries are like sort of a country, I don't know, <laughs> 190, 191 countries in the world. Um, we don't have official relations with countries like Iran or Cuba, although we do send officers to Cuba. Um, but a lot of countries, we don't have an official diplomatic relationship where we have an embassy. But for the most part, most of the places in the world, we do. And you have to be available to serve in all of them. That being said, my husband and I have not had to be separated yet um, in the Foreign Service. We know that that might be something in the future that we'll have to figure out, being two officers. Um, but so far, we've been able to stay together as a family, move with our children and our pets. We take two cats with us also um, around the world. I am a public diplomacy officer, and what that means is I work with different exchange programs to tell, tell America's story or help um, our foreign interests and our foreign nationals in other countries learn more about America and who we are. So we work with like the Fulbright programs, we do exchange programs with journalists, and also a big component of our responsibility is our media outreach and, press, and working with the press. My husband is an economic officer, and his main role is they, he promotes U.S. economic interests and trade interests abroad. Then there are three other career tracks, management, consular, and political. All of these career tracks, we do, we're doing the same thing. When we go overseas, we're implementing foreign U.S. policy overseas. When we, we also work in the Washington, D.C. main State Department. And when we're in the main State Department, we're taking the information that's sent overseas from our officers overseas, and we're sending that on to Secretary Clinton to formulate and make U.S. policy. So in the State Department in Washington, D.C., they're actually making and writing U.S. policy, sending it out to us overseas, and we are implementing that policy in our work abroad. So although we focus on one area, we are generalists. What this means is, even though there's five career tracks and you're, you're put into one, you have the opportunity to work in all five career tracks and they hope that you will gain experience in all of them so that one day if you're called upon, you could run an embassy in any capacity. So like I said, I was talking about career ADD. That's why it's really good. Because if, if you're working with the media and it's really stressful, then your next job you can say, you know what, I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to <laughs> do research and write reports. I'm, I need a break. So you can, you, can, you can choose your jobs that way when you write, when you propose your bids of where you will be moving next. Um, the other thing it, with the State Department, it's crucial, and, we, and I brought this up many times, is that you have to be excited and like change in your life, which is good and bad. Um, we're finding, when we left China, it was the first time my son, I think, had a really good idea that we were moving. And... He was, you know, am I going to make friends in America? Do they speak Chinese? Can they talk to me? Like questions that he had that I hadn't thought about before now that he's five. Whereas when we were in Brazil, he was a baby and it was so, you know, he did pick up Portuguese before he picked up English. But, I mean, the move was, is I realize the move will get, you do involve your children because they're moving, they're making new friends, they're going to new schools. Um, for us, if you're in a job that you can't, you know, you're just, this isn't what I wanted to be doing. You just stick it out for 20 more months and you're on to your next thing. If you have a boss that's annoying you, it's the same thing. <laughs> Wait till he'll leave before you probably, or you leave. And also, um, you bid where you're going a year out. So I don't actually arrive in Cairo till next summer, but we knew last summer that we were going to Cairo next summer because I have a year of language training in between. So while we were in China, we'd only been in China for a year, but I already knew in my mind we were going to Egypt next, so I could say, oh, China, I can, I can deal with this <laughs> craziness because I'm leaving in nine months going to Egypt. So that part, I, I kind of like always kind of planning and knowing ahead that way. Uh, 
But there, as you move further along in the Foreign Service, you can stay longer in some places. It depends on the type of job you're in. And also, you can be stationed in Washington, D.C. for up to, I think, five to six years, approximately. Um, lastly, I just wanted to talk briefly on what, what, what do we do. So a typical day, I was a consular officer in Shanghai, and we interviewed for visas to come to America about 1,000 Chinese applicants a day. There were 10, of, 10 other officers like me, so we each interviewed about 100 people. And I thought the interview would be, you know, really long and complex. It'd take like 10 minutes. It was like one minute. Like after you do 2,000 of them, I could already tell who was qualified and who was not. You have the information you need on the computer, whether they pass the security checks and whatever. And so the big morning push was to get through the interviews. Then the rest of the day I was either in working with American citizens abroad, and these are Americans who go to China and have some problems sometimes. Either they've deceased and died, we need to work and help them with their families, or they're, we had a destitute teenager running around China. Um, that was crazy. <laughs> we had a, a guy who liked to run around with no clothes on. We had to go help him um, also. You know, just people that sometimes go over to China and get in trouble, we help them. But one of the most interesting things I do is I visited the U.S. prisoners who were in Chinese prisons. We visited them every month. Um, they were all in different cities around Shanghai's concert district, and we would visit with them, check on their status, attend their hearings or their trials if necessary, uh, communicate messages to their families, and write our reports to the State Department. So that was, that was an interesting part. The other part of my responsibility, I managed the Fraud Prevention Unit, which was, they say anything can be made in China, and this is very true. Anything can be fabricated very quickly, very well. So we'd have people coming in, I'm a millionaire, here's my houses and my cars, and then everything's fake. Their name's fake, their real estate's fake, the bank document's fake. Um, so that was, that was really challenging, because they're really good at making copies over in China. Um, lastly, because the Foreign Service career path, the ultimate, ultimate ending of the career would be to become an ambassador or a consul general at a consulate. And most of the ambassadors are career foreign service officers. Now there are a handful that are politi politically appointed by the president, and those are, well it's different now, but <laughs> before they were like, you know, George Bush's cousins and people contributed a lot of money, they get to go to the Bahamas or, you're going to Malta, congratulations. Um, usually they, they put people, they put foreign service people in key situations, or key countries, such as Turkey is always, usually, a career foreign service officer because of the complex issues involved. Um, Turkey is a secular Muslim com uh, country, stands between Europe and the Middle East, and there, there's always strategic issues there. So th that's an example. If you're interested in more about this, I encourage you to register and take the foreign service exam. It's a free exam. You just apply online, and they're offering it more than they did when I joined. There's a big push right now to actually fill the jobs that are out there. And I, I, I believe we're hearing rumors of a significant increase in funding so that they will be, they're basically taking everybody on the register list and trying to fill them into entering classes and get people out there and get them trained. So now is a good time if you're interested. Um, there are some brochures afterwards that um, I think Corey has received. And for the best in information site is at careers.state.gov. So thank you for listening. And at this time, I'd like to take any questions. Yes. Yeah, I will. I'll restate your question. Go ahead. Uh huh. His question is, for the written exam, he still has three years left in school. Should he take it now or should he wait? That's really up to you. If you like taking tests, um, take it now. <laughs> because you'd, it's free and you could see if you passed and then if you passed, then yay. Um, but like I said, the, the hiring process I think is being 
pushed along faster than it was when we joined. It took my husband a year before his checks went through. Um, when I joined, it was only five months. And I just had a friend who passed the orals who was told, be on board for September or October. So it just kind of depends on your timing. Um, you may take it when you get out of college and not pass for three years. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just kind of your choice. I would say it's free. Take it. See what the test is like. Get a feel for it. Yes. Yes. Does taking the test <laughs> help you at all to decide, um, you know, to his point, um, he has three years left. I have quite a bit of time left. Will that help us to see if this is something we want to go towards, the, the actual taking of the test, besides just if we, you know, get in or whatever? My personal opinion is no. Like every test, for example, if you take the LSAT to go to law school, it's not indicative of what you'll be doing. Um, one of the questions on my test was, which cartoon satires office, you know, offices in America? And it was like Garfield, Dilbert, and, you know, Looney Tunes or something. The, the test is very broad. The, what they're looking for is a variety of things, and one of them is that, are you American? Like, have you lived in America enough to go overseas and be a representative of America? I mean, it, and I found the best way, really, when I've met people, um, they're people who are generally interested in current events. They read the paper usually. They're interested in what's going on on TV. They want to know more. Um, those are the types of factors I would, I would think about. More, more so would be the lifestyle. Would you want to be uprooted every two to three years? But then in the meantime, is that a, is that a good trade-off for you to get to learn new languages and have your family you know, overseas with you and have these different experiences? So that'd be my suggestion. Yeah. Oh, there's a microphone. What is your least favorite part of your job? Hmm. Well, that's an interesting question because I love my job, right? <laughs> the State Department's a great place to work. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I think it would be. A lot of times you, you're excited and you think you're going to be doing, I guess, it's, I guess it's like this in every job, actually. Um, you're not sure what kind of role you're going to play. You may be the head person that's in charge of everything, or you'll be the person carrying around the Diet Cokes. You just don't know, and it's very random what position you're going to get. And so I've learned, I mean, I've learned over the past few years to be flexible with that, because opportunities come to different people at different times, and a lot of it's being in the right place at the right time. For example, we had many high-level visitors come to Shanghai. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger came for the Special Olympics, and we were all excited, and none of us got to meet him. Um, I just thought, wow, he's here, we're doing all this stuff for him, but none of us really got to meet him. I saw him from, like, you know, the bus way over there while we were... <laughs> <laughs> but then on the other hand, President Carter, Jimmy Carter, came to Shanghai, and I got to be involved with being responsible for one of his events. I had to set up the room and be responsible for the program, and I got to meet him there. So it's just kind of ran a lot of it is knowing that there's a small percentage of your job that's not, that's not, you're not in control of. Um, you may or may not have to be sent, you may or may not have to go to this meeting. You may be, half of your colleagues will get to go to India for a meeting, and you don't get to go. It's just, I mean, that's how funding works, and it's timing, and you're in the right place, doing the right thing at the right time. So just being flexible with that, I think, is a big learning thing. Because you go in thinking, oh, we're all going to have the same career path, and I'm going to get all these opportunities. The reality is you're going to get amazing opportunities, but a lot of them, you're also going to have to, it's a trade-off. You're going to have to work with others, and, and sometimes you'll have to be the person that, you know, might... There was a mid-level officer, been in 12 years, and when President Bush came, um, their responsibility was to sit on the runway of Air Force One watching all the suitcases for two days, just watching them, just looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, I mean, so that's, there's the glamorous part that sounds glamorous, and then there's the not-so-glamorous part, so that's a trade-off. That's a really good question. 
Um, and that's interesting. And I mean, we learn U.S. policy, we learn the laws, and our job is to apply the law and to implement the policy, even if we don't agree with it. And that being said, there are channels, if you don't agree with the policy, for you to voice your opinion in an appropriate way. Um, one thing that was interesting to me, because my first job was a concert officer, a full range of concert services, including helping Americans, but like I said, also interviewing Chinese people for U.S. visas. And one thing I didn't know, I mean, I'd been to law school and said, I don't know, I thought I knew immigration law, sort of, um, is that every person that comes for a U.S. visa, we assume that they're guilty and they're going to immigrate illegally. That's how the law reads. And that was interesting to me because when I'm interviewing people, I'm thinking, you know, part of me was thinking, this is America, land of milk and honey. We want to share this with the peasant who wants to come over and fulfill their dream. He wants to come over where he can get more opportunities than he can in his village in China. But he doesn't qualify under the law, and I have to deny that visa. Whereas the rich kid in China whose parents own a million dollar company, he's been to every country on earth and just wants to go to California to go surfing, he qualifies for the visa. Because I know he'll come back to China. Why would he ditch his million dollar fortune in China to go work at Arby's in South Dakota or something? <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's kind of different. And that's just an example. But, I mean, we apply the law, we do it, and, and there are channels if you disagree, but for the most part, um, it's very exciting right now because we do have a new Secretary of State. Uh, when my husband joined, it was under Secretary Powell, and each Secretary of State has kind of their own agendas and how they're pushing the State Department to go t focusing on different things. And Secretary Powell is very different than Secretary Rice's agenda. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens under our new Secretary. There's a question here. <laughs> Yes, there are many, many opportunities to do that. We actually have, um, in the State Department, there are different bureaus that focus on different things. And, for example, there's a bureau that works specifically with refugees. And you can work in the State Department coordinating those projects, or you work with the programs in each country. It really depends on the country and what is the focus of the U.S. programs that the U.S. is working with that country for. Brazil had a lot of street children. And at the time, I was not an officer, but I, there were a lot of service opportunities in Brazil to get involved. And so that's, that's how I was able to, to work with that. And a lot of my husband's colleagues who were officers um, participated in the projects with me and helped me with the projects. A lot of it was on their own time, and some of it, um, we did some events at the consulate for the orphanage and for the kids. So that was coordinated with the consulate, but a lot of it is on your own initiative. China is a little bit different. Um, they're very sensitive about many things, and so we didn't, I didn't have, there isn't access to orphanages really in China. You can't, as a foreigner, just go and visit a random orphanage. They just, they're, they're kept very, you know, they're out in undisclosed locations, and it's not something you can do. So it really depends on the opportunities available in, in the country. And we work with USAID, it was another thing I was going to mention. Thanks. Um, did everybody hear that question about family? <laughs> if, you, if you're a tandem couple like we are, how do we um, watch our children? Well, there's two things. Um, one thing, being overseas, we, ha um, we were fortunate in Brazil and in China, is they, they have nannies. And they have d domestic housekeepers and gardeners and drivers that are rarely, readily available to foreigners that aren't. It's not the same case here in America. So for our younger, when our children, um, when our son was really young, he, we had a full-time nanny and we had a full-time housekeeper that helped us with that. Uh, <clears throat> another thing is it depends on what kind of job we're taking. If me and my husband are in the same um, 
job, then we we do work together in coordinating our events. For example, he, my husband wouldn't, would take a traveling event with the ambassador for a couple days. Maybe they'd, he'd be you know working long hours with the ambassador. I would not participate in that program the same as him. Um, some we there are some after hours things that. As Foreign Service officers, we go to be representatives of. For example, if they open a new museum, they want consulate people there to clap hands and say, congratulations, the United States is very proud to be here. Well, my husband and I usually don't go to those same things together because that would take us away from, I'd be, we'd be gone you know, three nights a week from our home, which which is just our own personal choice. But you can work it out. There are a lot of tandems. Um, in, in my section in China, we had three tandems. So there were six of us who were married to each other out of an 11-person place. So five people were not married to each other, and six of us were. And two of the couples of us, we were both BYU Mormons, the same branch. So, I mean, it just, so they knew that when we had events, that only one Neil could go, one Davis could go, because we all have families. So that, I mean, they work with you, and that's not something where they say, oh, well, obviously they're not going to say, oh, leave your children unsupervised in a foreign country. They, they, <laughs> they work with you on that. Yes. Off of that, um, do you feel it's, I, I kind of feel like a silly question, but do you feel it's an advantage uh, working as a tandem couple? Because I can't help but think, you know, let's say hypothetically if I were to work in this and was working overseas and I had a wife who wasn't in it, is that harder? I'm um, the only harder part is finding jobs together. So we're going to Cairo next. Cairo is a huge embassy. There are many jobs for me and many jobs for my husband in our different career tracks, in our different levels. I'm a junior officer. He's a tenured mid-level officer already. So we're in, we're in different situations, but embassy, or the Cairo, Cairo embassy is big enough to accommodate that. We probably will never go to, like, Malta, because Malta has maybe four people, and one of them is the ambassador. And so that would be me and my husband supervising each other or something strange, which, which they don't allow husband and wife to supervise each other. That's the only other condition. Um, the, there are assignments where they do not allow families to go. For example, Baghdad, Kabul, Afghanistan. Um, we don't send children there. And so my husband and I are not interested in us both taking those jobs or even one of us. Yes, do you have a comment, Jim? Yeah. Is that your question? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. I, I do, um, and that's just because that was something I liked. I, I liked, when we first heard about the job, I was interested in the job just as much as my husband was. It depends on where you go and what kind of country and what your spouse's situation is. There aren't a lot of jobs, for example, um, if you're, if, for example, in China, it's very difficult for a spouse to work on the local economy. The consulate and the embassies, though, they do provide spousal employment. So when I was in Brazil, I was a spouse. We had a young son at home. I was able to work part-time at the consulate. doing. I, I had two different jobs. And they, they offer jobs to spouses that want to work. Yes, there are jobs available. But again, it depends on the country and the place. Um, Shanghai also had a, a lot of spousal jobs. Because um, there just there just was a lot of opportunities for that. So what when you are picking your countries, that will be one of your big considerations: is what will spousal employment be like for my spouse? In Brazil, a spouse could teach at a school very easily. They could get a job teaching English for a year. Even if you didn't have an education background, it's just it's easier to get on at the school. Um, China was similar, except we had the, they were restricted. So I just when you're looking at your countries, you would investigate spousal employment. And the State Department has information on all each country and their spousal employment situation that you could check out before you bid on those countries. Yes. Um, how long does it take to get to be a tenured officer, or is is there a process where you keep continue applying and you, and you may not be accepted to be a tenured officer? I, I'll be honest, I don't know anybody, well, never mind. <laughs> I do know one person who wasn't tenured. <laughs> and um, his, you can look him up on Google. He's now in jail somewhere. Um, <laughs> he is not tenured. But the tenure, after three years, you come up for tenure the first time. So actually, I'm up for tenure right now. 
but I won't find out till the end of the year if I've been tenured. You have f up until five years to get tenured and then you're asked to find an alternative career option. Um, but I mean, like I said, most generally, I mean, I think eventually everybody gets tenured. I, I think <laughs> it's kind of a process. Um, you every year after you've worked a year, you do an evaluation with your supervisor, and so your file goes before a tenure board, and they look at everybody that's up for tenure, and um, they they tenure as many people as they can. The, the state department kind of has to because you have to think of it as everybody's moving up ranks. And so they need people at different ranks, and so they'll look at different things um, to tenure you. But you can get tenured at three years, four years, and then when you reach your fifth year, um, they really, really say, okay, this is it, time to get tenured. And then your usually your supervisor will really work with you and help you overcome whatever weaknesses are lacking. So what's, what's the difference between a non-tenured position and a tenured position? That's a good, right. A tenure, what's the difference between tenured and non-tenured? A tenured position is you have a job, you're set for life. Um, unless you have an egregious problem, espionage, go to get convicted in another country, I don't know, whatever your problem is, um, you are State Department Foreign Service till you want to retire. And that's, so it's job security. And, and um, you, get, you get advanced on to be promoted. And with each, each promotion, your, you get a, your salary also continues to, to go. Oh, yes. Um, there are different requirements to get tenured. And one of them is having achieved a certain level in, in one foreign language. And before you're tenured, um, you are, people, I mean, we're all coming to a different place, a different background. So you may know five languages, the guy next to you knows zero, never studied a language. Well, the person who knows zero, his counselor who's helping him in his career track is going to put him in a, you know, encourage him and put him in a job where he has to learn a language like Spanish or something. So that box will be checked for tenured. They kind of keep track of you and help monitor you as you go along. How hard is it to move from uh, like a junior officer position to a specialist position, like uh, information resource officer or something like that? It's completely, it's a it's different process. Um, you come in as a foreign service officer, foreign service generalist, which means you can do a variety of jobs. Or you come in as a foreign service specialist, as a computer person, which means every place you go, you, you, will, you will be in charge of the computer systems and the um, software for the embassy. So like ours are always kind of changing. Your specialist field will change in terms of responsibility and how big the embassy is and your staff. But your particular job function will stay the same. I don't think there's a, yeah, I don't, they're very. Yes. Good question. Oh, here and then. I have two questions for you. Um, first of all, I'd like to know what it's like to be LDS and in the Foreign Service, and then the other question I have is um, what changes have you seen or do you anticipate with the new administration with President Obama and Secretary Clinton? The first question, um, it's great. There are, so, there are more LDS officers in the Foreign Service than I thought there would be. My entering class was about 90 people and there were six of us who were LDS. Um, we, in Brazil, we had three or four families who worked at the consulate. We were in the same ward. And in China, there were three, in Shanghai, there were three, family, three to four families at one time also who were LDS working at the consulate. Um, that may just be the two countries we went to, Brazil and China. I'm sure, um, you know, in Sudan or something, <laughs> there's probably not a lot. But that's one thing that we also look at when we bid. Uh, when, if we weren't going to Cairo, the other option for our family was Havana, Cuba. And we looked into that and we just couldn't find any information about a branch there, 
or a lot of LDS families there. And so that was a big concern to us, having small children. And But there are a lot of families who do it. Um, we have colleagues in Oman, and they have the services in their home with the two other LDS people that are there. So, And the second question, changes. Well, I, I think it is going to be very interesting, and it's just starting. <laughs> um, and as... One thing is, you know, with, Pres with President Bush in the, in the last eight years, the State Department was kind of on one track for many years. We were focused on, you know, stability in Iraq and that region and Afghanistan. Um, Secretary Rice pulled a lot of jobs from posts such as Berlin and Paris where we just didn't need 25 officers in Paris, we needed them in Afghanistan. That's where we needed people. So, I mean, there was a lot of sh shifts and changes going on during that time. And so, I'm not, I mean, and, and I think it's going to be, it's not going to be overnight, but it'll be interesting to see what foreign policy objectives the Obama administration is going to focus on. And I know the big question everybody has is, what about Iraq? We did, um, or it's near completion, the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad will be our biggest embassy. And up to date, uh, it staffs about 500 foreign service officers. And I, that's the biggest in the world. I think in Shanghai, we were 29 officers, just in Shanghai. So it'll be interesting to see if that's something that's going to continue where we're going to be filling those jobs or not filling those jobs. Or, and, and I know that... Um, in, in reading this, as you have in the news, that Obama is committed to uh, withdrawing in Iraq and turning over uh, the government, turning over the government to the Iraqi people. And what role we will play and how the military will be involved or not is, 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 a, is a question right now. I, I really don't have the answer to that. Um, one thing with, that's different with us, we work alongside our military peers in these situations, but as diplomats, we don't, we don't carry weapons. We're there to negotiate and talk. And so a big concern has been, well, if it's stable enough that we can be there unarmed doing our job, that's the question a lot of us have. How many years do you need to work in the Foreign Service before you can retire? And do you have... Do you know if it's pretty f common for people to leave the Foreign Service after about 10 to 15 years and work in another career? For, for retirement, <clears throat> there are two things. You have to be 60 years old, sorry, 50 years old, and be in the Foreign Service for 20 years. So I joined when I'm 30, when I was 30. So I planned it perfect, so when I'm 50, I can retire. <laughs> I'm just but my husband joined a lot earlier, so he has to still, he'll be 50, but he'll have to still be in 20 years. There was, did you have a question? No. Okay. Oh, and your other question, how many people leave? Um, it, de it depends. I think it has a very, it's, it's relatively low compared to how many people join in. The people that I know that have left have joined pretty early on. They knew at the beginning this isn't what I want to do. We had a really good friend of ours, and he was just he was just a fun, great guy in Shanghai, really outgoing and everything. But he showed up, and he thought, oh, I thought I was going to, you know, live in a tent among the people and build wells and stuff. And we said, no, that's the Peace Corps. <laughs> we don't do that. And so he was, you know, just a little bit not sure if that's what he wanted to do, and he, he took a different path, so he left a little early. I think... People, who have, once you've reached tenure and you've put in 10 to 15 years and knowing you can retire at 20 years, I think a lot of people stick with it. I mean, because by that time, you're, you're taking the higher level jobs in the embassy and, I mean, your, your career's already shooting upward, so. Sure. Last question. Okay, so I didn't grow up in the U.S. for most of my education, so I don't know um, a lot about the government and how it works. What would you suggest for someone like me? For taking the test? For just being in the foreign service in general. Yeah, for preparing in that area. I think the best thing would be like those cram books on like U.S. history. What are they called? Cliff notes. Cliff notes, yeah. <laughs> like a cliff note crash course in U.S. history. For, I mean, 
they don't expect you. There, there are people who are very, very knowledgeable and retained all of their information about U.S. diplomacy since Benjamin Franklin, and they know all of that. But I'd say for the most part, most of us are learning as we go. Um, the, in Washington, D.C., there's a training institute where we receive our trainings, the Foreign Service Institute. And they have a library there with all kinds of resources. And so when you're in training, you can go to the library, check out some videos, whatever. And then it's not, I'd say it's not something you really need to worry about on your own right now, unless you're preparing for the exam, which for the exam, they do, they do look at world history also, not just US history. Um, but for learning how the government works, there's lots of resources online just to get a refresher. Like I said, they're not going to nitpick you on who's the senator of Alabama. So thank you very much for your, for your time. That if, was my last question. If, oh. I could take, if I could make one comment. Yes. For those who may have like two or three years left before they're going to be graduating, <laughs> there are internship programs with the State Department that are excellent um, where you can go and work in the embassies and consulates overseas for a semester and usually you can arrange credit, uh, some sort of like credit for that. And, um, but the process is a little bit lengthy. It'll take you about six months of, of uh, applying and getting prepared to be admitted to that program. So think about a semester out to apply. The other thing is, is um, there's lots of fellowships and scholarships available for um, completing undergrad or for doing a graduate program for people that are committed to foreign service, um, foreign service careers. Um, one of them is called the Pickering Fellowship. Um, on the careers.state.gov, it'll have information about fellowships and internships. And so if you're not looking to graduate in the next couple years and you think if you take the Foreign Service exam right now, it might be a little too early for you, check out some of those options. Thanks, Jim. Okay, thank you very much.